All right, this is the kind of place that you wouldn't stand and be barefoot, but there's someone here that's barefoot, Dave Ketching, because he lives here. This is a wonderful studio called Rancho de la Luna. They've been around for a long time. They make a lot of great records here, and we're going to take a tour. Let's go. Let's go check it out. Right now we're inside Rancho de Luna. This is Dave's hideaway and a safe haven for some of the coolest girl in the world. Dave, tell us about what we got here. What are we looking at? What is this world about? Well, I don't have tons of outboard gear, but I've had these for a long time. The TC2290 and the Eventide H3000. These both bought both of these used in the early 90s and they both still work perfectly. So when they were built to last and they both sound incredible. Mm -hmm. Using the purple Sweet 10 rack for my buddy Dave Raphael's awesome transistor company. They're called Autac. These are his EQs that he designed that are some of the best you can get. Nice. Some some old um, Avitas. Those are the best, the 312s, yeah. uh, yeah, made by Brent Averill, but yeah. in the 90s. Yeah. They're so, APIs basically, but like he made them the best they sound they sound incredible still these are dave's uh, autac compressors which are modeled after some neve compressors that are uh, like in, built into the boards they're really great got some rupert neve the 517 that's really great for bass the gtq made by aurora they 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 did some really cool uh, gears, they all work for Neve back in the My 70s. friend has a console, actually a full oh, console. Oh, the GT, yeah. the, the Aurora? Yeah. Oh yeah, my God, it must be amazing. It is, it's insane. In, in Honolulu, what's up, Dimitri? Overstayer, those guys make great yeah. gear, more Rupert Neve stuff. You know, using the, the Apollo 16s by UA, they make some of the best stuff right now, I think. That MXR delay has got to be smoking cool, right? So... I got this from Greg Coates. Do you know Greg yeah, Coates? Yeah, of course. Right, so, That's, I'm that, okay, I know you had that one. So I bought that. I bought one new in the when they came out in the early '80s, and it got stolen. Oh man! And I was looking for one, and I went to visit Future Music, and there was one sitting on a shelf behind Greg. And, oh, that's right, in his back area, and, right? And I told him I wanted to buy it, and he goes, "Oh, you can just have it." Uh, and I'm like, well, let me let me pay you for it. And he said, well, somebody just traded me this for a setup. Yeah. I'm like, well, how much is your setup? He's like, 40 bucks. I'm like, well, let me give you 100. And he's like, no, no, 40 bucks is fine. Oh so now God. I I, re I reclaimed it like 30 years later. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, I love it. A lot of the sounds from like Tom Tom Club, you yep. can, the, the weird flangey stuff mm -hmm. from Genius of Love, you can do on that. This uh, is one of my favorites. Two people don't really know about oh, yeah, these. Oh, yeah, the Effectron, you can still get these pretty cheap. Unfortunately, when they when the board goes out, You're they're gone. Yeah. But I, I think I found this for 125. So they do a lot of really cool things. Uh, they're they're quarter inch only. They don't have uh, XLRs. Yeah, XLRs. My friends at Game Changer, their plasma rack. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen the pedals for that. What do you use that for? Anything? Uh, we use it a lot for drums, for distorting drums. But it it can be used on anything. They make great gear. They're really cool kids, and they they really think outside of the box a lot. Mm -hmm. I see you have one of these shirts. These are the ones that have the compressors in them. Those are the ones that have the compressors. Uh, yeah. The that was off of one of the show us your junks. I, I saw someone using that. Was um, it Rob? Yeah, it was Rob Schnapp. Okay. And he he pointed out that you could get one of those for a hundred bucks, and I did. And it's four channels of line level lock. So yeah. if you can find one of those. I did notice the. I told someone else about it, and they are going up. Oh so man, I'm gonna try to get it. tonight. I'm getting one. I'm you, going you, home. you should look, man. It it, it sounds great because it is four channels of that. And people don't even know it. The real nice compressor. No, that's another sleeper, right? This guy. That was a, an Albini. Show right. us your junk. Yeah. He pointed these out for seventy bucks, which I think I got that for. I think they're still a hundred bucks, something like that. Yeah. And they're called an RNC, which means a real nice compressor. Yeah, I haven't used it yet. Mm. I, just I used to use it on overheads. It was smoking cool. Really? Yeah. I should get another one to have a stereo. This is one of my favorite synths made. It's the 
the Yamaha Reface CS. I don't know if you've ever used never, these. Never, never. They're they're incredible. They're, the stuff that they do is it's all self contained in there. It's, it's not it's all, MIDI. So, no, it's got effects built in. Wow. I, I mean, it is. You, you can do MIDI out, so mm-hmm. you can use bigger keyboards, and you know. But, what is it uh, called again? It's a Reface. They have a looper on them. They they have built in effects and. Mm-hmm. The filters are great on them. I, I use this a lot, and I and I have a lot of synthesizers. Neotech, Neotech Alon console. That's uh, my that John Russo. He's my main engineer here. He's the the guy. Yeah. And he just recapped this a couple of years ago, and he continues to repair it when it has any problems. So right now, it's all a hundred percent, which is it's hard to do in the in the desert. There's a yeah. lot of dust, like. I dust every day and you, it still looks like like it's something blew in. And tell me about these speakers here. I've, I've never seen these ones before. These Event Opals, they don't make those anymore, but I really love those. That's what we use mostly. And the uh, Yamaha H8s, which I really love. I think they're great. They're like kind of beefier NS10s. Mm-hmm. So both of those were very, like the, H8s are super affordable. Absolutely. And, and they're, they're, you know, if you don't have a ton of dough, they're, they sound amazing. When I was uh, in Singapore, that's what I had the band buy. So I, I, I lived in a bomb shelter for a year, oh, yeah. and I had them go buy these. So I'm very familiar with them. And it's strange that when I came back, I didn't buy a set because I had NS10s. Yeah. Uh, somewhere down the road, I think I may just get some of these because I, I really enjoyed them. They're really great for overdubbing, and they give you a really good sound uh, a sound feel to work on. And you don't get as fatigued, ear fatigued as, yeah. as some. But Yamaha, they just make great everything. You know, they're the, they're, as Hutch told me, they're the only company that can make everything to make the sounds, to amplify the sounds, and to make the sounds travel. <laughs> they, have, they, have, they have motorcycles, planes, I mean, you yeah. know, come on. All the instruments, they yeah, make every everything. instrument. Cool. It's, so uh, the Neotech Alon, this is my friend Mike Egan. He did a portrait of me. That's you? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody? He's, yeah, he's a great portrait. Really great artist. Let me see. Yeah. There's a little bit of a resemblance. A little bit, you know, like maybe when I, I'm gone. That's Fred Drake, who started the studio here. There's a little picture to Fred. Yeah, it's a 3D photo I took of him a while back. Love it. And this is kind of the keyboard room. It's a little hard to get in here, maybe. Um, my friend Luke at Custom Vintage Key Repair just repaired my Krumar DS2, which is pretty rare and weird. That thing looks insane. And I've got my Moogs that are great and this Roland that I got. What is this one under here? This is an SH-101. Old Roland. I've never seen one of those. That thing looks amazing. I bought this from a guy and on the way there, my engine caught on fire, but my car kept running. But you made sure that got out of the car? Yeah, I got that out of there. The more Moog stuff. um, this is my friend Jamie Hafler just fixed this for me. It's a uh, a Roland Compuphonic, mm-hmm. which does some really cool stuff. The same guy that sold th- sold me the cool mics and the TC and the uh, Eventide sold us the Whirly and the Rhodes. This is one of the the best sounding Rhodes pianos in the world. It has the uh, Dino My Piano mod. And the Rhodes has Rhodes mics on it. Yeah, right? it does. It does have Rhodes <laughs> mics on it. I didn't even think about that. Uh, okay. These are more of the Yamaha Reface. This is their mini version of the DX7. These are great. These are This is their electric piano. These have built-in uh, effects as well. And this does... Um, Dude, that's insane. A speaker on it? Yeah. Th- you, can, you can put all four of them in your backpack. There's a... There's also an organ, and then obviously lots of guitars, my Echo Park Flying V. Really quick, I th- I love Hamers. This is not a Hamer, but what is this? That's a Woodbine. Uh, they're out of Canada, uh-huh. and that is a f- really fantastic guitar. Look at this. It's made really... It's like a flame top Les Paul. It, it sounds I- so good, that thing. It's a little heavy for live. It I was is. using it live for a minute, but it's a little large. Uh-huh. My double neck Dan Electro. I used to play that live quite a bit. 
And and also, if you didn't know, did, please name the bands that you've. Uh, too many. To, to, okay, how about a band that you played that in? Well, I played that with my band Earthlings and mm -hmm. Eagles of Death Metal. I used it a lot recording with uh, Queens of the Stone Age mm -hmm. and Mark Lanigan. I used that on some of his records. And if you, Mark Lanigan is one of the greatest singers in God Rest His Soul. He yeah. just passed uh, about a year ago, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. It was in the Screaming Tree. So, you know, Dave is, I will say, speaking for him, like spent a lot of his career playing with these artists that were like real deals. And even the studio, you know, me walking in here, I've seen a lot of studios in my life, but I feel like this place is like home in a lot yeah. of ways. So as a musician, you'll come in and I think that's why like, without naming names, people come in there and instantly they're like, wow, I want to write a song and they go straight to this or they pick up that guitar and that's yelling some kind of riff to them. And that's what kind of studio I feel this is. It's like a very personal studio. Yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to move guitars out of here because people gravitate to different things, you know, like the closets have more weird keyboards, you know, mm -hmm. who knows, somebody might pick up this guy and use it for a drum machine yeah. or... Oh, and you got uh, drawers here, please share. <laughs> the drawers here are kind of Look full that. of weird effects. I've been kind, people have been really kind to, you know, donate amazing pedals so that people can get inspired over, you know, like it's kind of, it's kind of overflowing at this point. You even have like Moog's hiding in the mm -hmm. cabinet. I think a little tiny wow. Casio. That was, I think I got this for a quarter at the swap meet. Yeah, the Echo Park There's was, a story I used in that. that one. Yeah, I used that one quite a bit all around. And uh, my friend Joe Parker made me this guitar. He makes really beautiful guitars. My old Gibson, this thing was in like 40 pieces. And my friend Mark Fuquay from uh, Motor Ave put it back together. So there's that. They all come in handy. Almost everything has been played on something here. Like I said, most, most people just kind of gravitate to whatever. This Pro One was bought by Fred Drake, and he bought this from Mark Mothersbaugh. I guess it was a Devo keyboard at one point. He bought this and our Lindrum. And then you got the Mellotron. The Matriarch, which is one of the coolest scents. It's a modular as well as, you know. And your pedal board oh, in the bottom. Oh, this, this is the, uh, the Yamaha. That's the organ. Oh, that's so great. So all these, I, I did a tour with only these as my keyboards, and they all four fit in my backpack. So that, that's cool. My friend Civi Sound made that for me. It's a weird compressor and reverb machine that sounds wacky as hell. Um, the, my friend um, Rick Wilkinson that made, he does the, the microphones the, uh, that I was showing you. Oh, there's our Rancho de la Luna Mezcal. So he made the, the uh, Cruncho de la Luna. And you know, that people don't know, you have your own tequila brand. Well, Mezcal. Okay. Almost tequila, just okay. in a different part of the world. All right, I love it. But yeah, that's our Rancho de la Luna Mezcal. It's the best. You can get no better. I mean, if you're around, try to find out where this is, have a drink of it. Um, if you imbibe, yeah. it, you, I think you'll find it very tasty. Love it, I love it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got this uh, Roland guitar synthesizer from a friend of mine. He was, he was getting rid of this. And I love these because I actually love the way these guitars was look. Was it Jonathan, they're, they're, was it? No. Jonathan Hinsky? No, he just told me he's got like seven yeah, of these he's things. He's got a bunch of them. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but that's the floorboard for it. Uh, this is a company called Grand Casino out of Italy, and uh, I'm doing a, a really cool pedal with these guys called the Fred. Wow. And it's going to be a phase shifter, fuzz, and reverb. Dude, these things are beautiful. They They're really so cool. great, and the and the people that make those are really cool. It almost looks part of the synth. More acoustics. My old guild I've had forever. My Martin, uh, Lou Lou Adler. I was doing a a record with him. He did everything from Rocky Horror Picture Show to Cheech and Chong and <laughs> Jan and Dean to Mamas and Papas. He gave me that guitar. 
And then that's my Yamaha. Now you did mention there was a some really cool pedals in this world here. Oh yeah. My okay. friend is. This is a themed pedal. Let's see if you can figure out what it is. It's called his company is called VVCO. And this it's called the Dark Father. Darth Vader's um, little Chess box. Chess piece, I guess. I love it. It's is really fantastic pedal. VVCO. Be sure to go get one of those because that will be used in many things. I've never seen this in my life, but a real skull fuzz pedal here. The skull fuzz is a great one. Of course, everyone needs the turd now, for that on. shitty sound. <laughs> but uh, my friend Dr. No makes these great pedals. He did, he did a lot of pedals with friends of mine and then he asked me if I would like to design a pedal with him. So you got the shit or the road runner. But tell him what happens on this pedal. How does it work? Oh, when you step on the, the turd, it the fly works. lights up. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the road runner. This is a fuzz octave wall. This pedal. is a work of art. And you know, road runners have wings, but they don't use them, but he <laughs> wanted wings on them, so it's it's accurate. Yeah, that one actually flies, supposedly. Yeah. And I mean look at the detail on the bottom. It just looks like a Clyde McCoy on the bottom or something. It's got a little story about us. My that's the whole story of me on the bottom. I love that. As we go along, we have the Line 6 Helix with the cabinet. This thing sounds great for everything. Wow. I, I use it quite a bit. Um, I really I really love what that sounds like. You, you can get some, you can plug anything into it. They have great bass settings. They have great guitar amps. You can make so many different sounds because it has all the effects built in. So you can dial in your own sounds and then that's like a 50 watt cabinet that you can hook up to it. So that's, that's good for live, that's live awesome. gigs. And then we get into the small drum tracking room. That's the Lin drum that Fred bought from Mark Mothers Bod. I don't know if they used it for Devo or if he was using it, but I think Fred bought that in the 80s. That's one of my favorite drum machines. Super heavy. They're heavy. <laughs> I was going to show you, but I'm like, no, Eric will have to do a close up on that guy. Yeah. But I mean, this is the drum machine that Diva would use. And it's one of the. Prince. Like, yeah, Prince. Funk or, Funkadelic. Rhythmics. Yeah, yeah, any band Parliament. that like made drum tracks, they would have the Lindrum. You know, and it was it was the best thing for people that were making records because the drummer would never be out of time. This would always yeah. be in time. And it did have a unique kind of analog sound. Oh, I know? love it. I mean, I love all the Prince songs that he used it on in Parliament, you yeah. know. Atomic Dog. I know. You know, what? You, when you said this is like a small drum room, I actually, I think this is a perfect size drum room. The ceilings are kind of vaulted in, in an angle. And so if you were having drums in here, it's not a square room, it's a rectangular room. So almost the way you guys have it focused down that way. Yeah. Seems to make perfectly good sense with keeping it sounding alive without a lot of uh, flutter echoes. You know, even you put these baffles up on the sides to stop some of that. And the drums look incredible, an old Gretsch kit, Ludwig snare. Well, we've, we've definitely tried them many different places. Uh, we used to have them in the living room and this was the control room when we first started for a while. Then we would, you know, like for certain desert sessions, we had two drum kits. So we had one here and one in the bedroom or yeah. face to face. A lot of times we've done stuff outside in the bar area. We strike the table and, and record with a few mics out there. It sounds wow. really good outside. You talk about real, like, you know, mics react off walls when there's no walls. Yeah. It's got to be crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. We're, we're working on a drum loop, drum package with Butch Vig produced, which is great. He came out for a few days and nice. we worked with Stella from Warpaint I and our Stella. friend Danny Frankel and our drummer that plays with uh, Mojave Lords, Barrett Martin, who was also in Screaming Trees and yep. R.E.M. And so those are the first three that we started doing and it should be ready pretty soon and they sound great. But we did half in here and half outside for different, different things. 
I love it. I remember Stella told me about how awesome it was. And I know she lives out here now, right? Yeah. yeah. She's got a great house out here. Her, her studio is coming together really cool, too. I'm going to talk to her about maybe going over there and visiting. And I made some microphones for her, so it was really cool to, like, just on a level of, of having someone, a great musician like that, try out your mics. And you got a mic coming from Manny. Yeah. I have, a, I have a mic company called Original Gravity Wave. And I've I made these ribbons, so I've got one coming for Dave that he can wait. use here. It's going to be awesome. I love Stella. She's one of my favorites, and she is a fantastic musician and one of the best drummers as well. I mean, uh, War Paint. Her drumming in War Paint is like it, yeah. so musical. She, yeah. And she plays with like authority, but also within the. Ba- I mean, you can't say enough about her drumming. It's so yeah. good. I just traded someone's studio time for this great twelve string Hagstrom. Oh my God! Which dude. is See if that it's in tune. Beautiful. Pretty close. I haven't tuned this in two months. I've never seen this particular Hagstrom in a 12 string. It's so good. It sounds so great. So you saw a guy and you're like, I gotta have that, or did he no, offer it he, to you? He brought it and needed <laughs> to trade something. And you and I were talking about yeah. how much we love the Dan Electro convertible. Oh my god, those are so beautiful. I got this from Jack Waterson when he was at Waldo's in the 80s. Mm-hmm. It was the only it was six, there were six hanging up, and they were all perfect except for this one. It, at the time, it had mismatched tuning gears, uh, no knobs, and it was the one that spoke to me the, the most. And for people that would not know about, we were speaking out about this as well, is that Dan Electros, even though they're considered, you know, even though I know Jimmy Page used them, but yeah. they don't have a lot of respect as far as the guitar world. But this is Eddie Van Halen's star guitar. If you look at pictures of him, this neck is on a star guitar. Yeah. Also, um, not this particular style of Dan Electro, but there is one that's on Randy Rhodes' famous polka dot flying B that Carl Sandoval had built that for him. Randy Rhodes wanted it to feel like a Dan Electro, so they said, well, give me your Dan Electro. And they actually attached a little part of the bottom wood. And they, I mean, there's so many pictures of Randy Rhodes playing it, yeah. but it's basically a Dan Electro. I mean, I love these. Jimmy Page, yeah. Cashmere, I mean, you can go down the list of David Holdago from Los Lobos. Yeah. I mean, do yourself a favor if you have a studio, go find a Danny, you know? It's it's the best to pick up and play. Like, you don't have to have it plugged in if you're just l- trying to work out some things. Mm-hmm. I took that on the road um, with Caius and Queens of the Stone Age, and Josh wrote a lot of songs on that oh, particular nice. guitar. These are two of my earliest guitars. I I got this in 1978, and it, it, was, wow. it was, I think it's a 69 Les Paul that a uh, place in Memphis called Strings and Things. I've never they, seen that style of a, of a Les Paul. Uh, they made five of these. They did double cutaways. This one is just falling apart because it's so. I've played it in every band mm-hmm. I've ever played in, and it just it sounds incredible. That's but they did five beautiful. of these, and um, I got one a few years. It was in. It was a little beat up, but I mean, this is. Where did you get it from? Uh, I, I I bought it from a place in Memphis called the Pick and Post. Mm-hmm. But I saw this guitar when it was new at Strings and Things, and this guitar was $4,000 in 1974. Wow. And I bought it for 878 So it's, it's one of my favorites. Having one of five Gibsons, just saying that makes you feel... That's why I didn't grab it or hold it. I'm oh, you like, should. You <laughs> should. This, this is also... Um, this is a 58 Strat that I got from Strings and Things. Dude. And I got this for... Six hundred dollars. With a Kaler. Well, yeah, the eight, the eighties. I added a Kaler Those and a little pickups, and people are gonna hate me. It's and then okay. I, I had a, a guitar tech that put on new tuners that split the neck, the headstock. Unfortunately, that asshole. But you Sorry. know what? <laughs> you know what? It's still my favorite. Like, so what year is this? It's a fifty-eight. Oh my god, Joe Bob, yeah. Joe Bonamassa. <laughs> we got one for you. The Kaler, you're going to love it. Yeah, you're going to love the Kaler, and you're going to love the Olympics for sure. You know, I will say playing it, it is meaty and just oh, yeah. fun. Uh, another just thing, nice. I got both of these in 1978, and I've played them in every band I've ever played with. Beautiful guitar. Now the Hagstrom, I can tell by the back. I traded that one for studio time to the same guy. He has a Hagstrom. I need to start doing sessions like you. <laughs> and then I got this from our friend Brian Murphy. It's a 58 uh, Supro. Wow. He was recording here a long time ago, and uh-huh. uh, I told him if he ever sold it, I'd love to buy it. And he called me a few years later and said, do you want this? Brian. It's not cheap. 
dude. Brian is one of my best friends, and that's actually a mutual friend of ours that we've known for years, Brian Murphy. And that that is a man with a, a lot of style on the guitar and as a person. He's one of the nicest dudes in the world. So there's a few of those. Mid-70s telly. I bought this for, at the same place, Waldo's. I bought this because I got asked to do a, a show with a rockabilly band called Panther Burns from Memphis, Tennessee, where I'm from. I like the naked lady on the top. Oh, yeah, I put that on there. And then I got Willie Dixon to sign it when I met him. Now, tell me about that foam under the bridge. What, what's, is that? Oh, it just keeps it from rattling, uh, rattling too much and a little too much overtones. But I got that. It, the, the gig I played paid for that guitar. So I bought that in 1988, same year I bought the... Now, we did talk about some microphones, but maybe share with us your little centerpiece here of what we have in the center of your room. Well, right now, I have this SE Gemini, which lives here because it sounds really great at this spot. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a really great kick and snare sound from mm -hmm. this point. This is, if we want to go weird, it's the AKG Fender reverb mic that has built-in spring reverb. Love it. On loan now, I'm lucky enough to have the Mojave Audio MA37, which is their new flagship mic, and I'm getting ready to try it out on drums. You, you did use it with Dusty. I did use it back. with Dusty. We used it on acoustic and vocals, but I haven't tried it on drums yet, so cool. I think I'm going to point it that way and see mm -hmm. what happens. Uh, the newest uh, UA Sphere mic, the modeling mic that does... Uh, it models all the great microphones that you would want with all the plugins of Neve and API, et cetera. Uh, and, and that's it, the one you can do from your DAW, right? You can change it within the yeah. software, correct? And you, yeah, you can change it. Mm -hmm. Even after recording, you can change proximity. I mean, it looks and like everything. a vintage tube mic. I mean, it oh, gives you that feeling if you're singing in it. Oh, it sounds great by itself, too. And it's it's a double uh, capsule. You can do stereo, which is great. Wow. It, it's I love it. Well, I know we're talking about some wide variety of mics with Dave, but make sure you check out Manny's Mic Locker. We're going to have a rundown of a lot of these mics and what are some of the favorites that Dave has here. So we're going to get back to the studio tour, but just to let you know, we have some very special treats that Dave shared with us and how he uses them. Check it out. Check it out, man. Right here, I have a 1904 Beckstein piano. And Fred and I got this at a thrift store. We bought it because we were doing an album with our neighbor, Victoria Williams, and she needed a piano. And I think she might have seen it at the thrift store, but we went and bought it and brought it here. And it's been on almost it, any album that's been done here that needed a piano, everyone used this because it sounds so great. But I was fortunate enough to have Beckstein's biggest, uh, I mean, their, their master builder, come here a few months ago and he worked on it and wow. got it really singing nicely. Now you have some ribbon mics hanging down. I mean, are these permanent? They just always sit there and you just go with them? They're there now just so that we can, you know, like obviously we experiment, but everything's kind of mic'd up in case my neighbors walk over and we want to record and we don't want to yeah. like set up mics. So yeah. these sound good. These are now called the VR ones. They used to be called the Voodoo. Voodoo's, yeah, I had a Voodoo one. Yeah, a Voodoo but two. they had to change the name. Do you know why? Because they were selling lots to churches. Oh, and they church. weren't. They want the Voodoo mic. They yeah, want the. Uh, they couldn't use Voodoo. Oh wow. Okay, I get it. You know, they're already patched in, so yeah. if somebody sits down. But this is one of the greatest sounding pianos. If I have? if I was if anybody plays piano and wants to play it. I'm not the best piano player. Neither am I, but uh, what, really quick, I know we've mentioned it before, please share that ominous mic in the corner. Oh, yeah, of course. How could I I'd be remiss not to mention this? <laughs> this is a Dave Royer prototype tube microphone. This is the mic, and that's the power supply. We'll be talking more about this in Manny's Mic Locker episode. Oh, yeah. We're pimping it. We're pimping that's pimping right. It. you got to watch that. That's going to be the real thing. But this thing is great. You can see that, um, as with all his mics to test the durability, he would throw them across the room. This one is no exception. It's pretty beat up. Yep. But it's, I put it up against every mic in the world, and it sounds as good to me as anything. 
And if you notice too about a studio, like almost every corner, there is a work of art or something that has a story. Like even where did this come from? My God. A friend of mine brought this back from Bali. Wow. And of course, the first thing that happened is I hung it up and it fell and dented oh. her nose and here. But it's still an amazing piece. My friend Lisa Austin gave me that. Yeah. I love it. And then watch your heads. We'll go into this is the, uh, the base room for the most part which has just all the base rigs kind of together. Um, this was our friend Brian O'Connor's, his rig that he used in Eagles of Death Metal for years. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of retired it into here for us. And, you know, he uses it whenever he does shows, but not so often for us anymore. But mm -hmm. that, that gets used almost every session, as well as this Ashdown little bastard. It's like no frills, just a 30-watt head that sounds amazing. It's an Ashdown 212 cabinet, so we, if we have that mic, then we can switch between all these heads very quickly. Also have this cool Guild Maverick. I don't know if you've ever used those. I know, I never, never have. Um, they almost sound like they have built-in fuzz. If you, if you turn them up, it overdrives mm -hmm. in such a freaky, super weird way. Under this is a Baldwin Super Sound. I've never seen that before. These are cool. Because Baldwin this, this was a keyboard what, company, right? Yeah, this is what um, Willie Nelson uses on his trigger on the acoustic guitar he has. Mm -hmm. And supposedly so does Neil Young. Oh, man. And I got that at the thrift store. This is a pedal board that Jamie Stillman from Earthquaker Devices, he was just out recording with us and this is a pedal board he put together on the subject of the ball one did you walk in the store and go oh my god there's a willie nelson amp or did you find it and then find out later that it was I, I i just was like wow this is cool it's got it's got multicolored buttons mm -hmm. and it's got tremolo and reverb and it's got super sound i mean you gotta buy that right yeah and then later when i had it a guy came in and he said this is the greatest keyboard amp that's ever been made mm -hmm. And then I found out Willie Nelson used it and then found out also Neil Young is a fan of these. Wow, and I love that you have the PVs, which are... Yeah, the PVs, yeah. yeah. This is a really interesting amp. I've never seen one of these before. A kid was selling this for 100 bucks on Craigslist, and I can't find anything at all about it. Maybe it was a PA it's unit? It's like solid state, right? It, yeah, it's solid state. It's got reverb... Um, the cool thing is, like when Joe Walsh was here, they used this only for the bass. They, they still have the setting on channel one that he used, mm -hmm. but there's four channels. So you can set them different and just kind of, if you need different I sounds. I love that they walk in here and they go, what are you going to use? We're going to use this. And they just, you know, dial it in, you know? The, so the funny thing about this thing is I'd never seen another one. A couple of months after I bought this, my friend Fredo Ortiz, you know, I know Fredo, Fredo? Of course, I love Fredo. He, he posts, I'm selling my... And pay for a hundred bucks. Who wants it? Oh and I, my God. I called them yeah. and I said I want it. So there's, there's. <laughs> so I have two of them. You know what? I missed that post by Fredo. <laughs> I missed He's it. He's the best. I slept on that one. Fredo, Fredo, that people that don't know, Fredo is. Um, he was in the Beastie Boys. Uh, he's currently on tour with Los Lobos. Yeah. Um, was with the uh, the Russian band. Um, Go Go Bordello. Yeah, Go Go Bordello. I mean, Fredo is, and also in Los Angeles, he's one of the greatest studio musicians for yeah. like percussions and drums. So shout out to Fredo, look him up. Um, but And one of the coolest you know, guys ever too. Totally, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, who can say they played in the Beastie Boys? Yeah. Know? And Los Lobos, yeah. David Holdago and crew. Wow, so uh, I take it we're in the bedroom, but it's not, it's not a bedroom. Uh, we have the oh. Gorilla Stack. Um, Look at this. So this, this TC35 was what Jesse Hughes recorded the first Eagles of Death Metal album and subsequent ones, but the whole first album was just this amp, and he gave it to me ages ago. And then I found the, the GB30 bass to go with it, and then I wanted to see what the 50-watt sounded like. Uh, they're all pretty weird. And then I've got my my PV stack or PV Mississippi Marshalls as we called them back in Memphis. Mississippi uh, Marshalls. You got the Decade, the Audition 20, the Audition 30, and the Studio Pro 50. Um, I forgot to show the bass in the other room, but I'll show that. But mm -hmm. the, 
the bass that's in the other room is Brian O'Connor's 57P bass. Mm. His dad bought that in, I think, 1961 or two yep. to go on tour with Loretta Lynn. Oh, my God. And he bought this basement. This is the basement here that he bought to go with that bass for that tour. So, so they're paired up. That's it. And it sounds so crazy great. And the Hayden amp, they, the Ashdown made those for a while. I don't think they're making this model anymore. It's called the Speakeasy. And it switches between uh, 6L6s or EL34. So you can get a it's, it's a rather voxish, but, you know, cool. This is my friend Kirby Brownell's artwork, but it's hiding an Ampeg sound cube. Have you ever used those? Never heard of that in my life, man. These are really cool. They're they're like little bait little bass amps like and they sound great so sick and what are you running out of that's the amp that's the amp never in my life have seen that and those sound killer it's kind yeah, of right. you have an ep3 behind it i do and that thing still works strangely and then my friend gave me the eddie van halen 5150 amp so, <laughs> i love that uh someone gave my friend bingo gave me the ox this is like a 15 watt Vox that sounds really cool. And then this AC30 the or AC30 50? sounds great. It's it's I think it's an early 90s, mm -hmm. which is supposedly a good one. Okay. Uh, from what I hear. Uh my friend Bruce Zinke made me these two amps, which are my favorite high gain amps. They sound like they look like Soldano's kind of. Kind of. They they for high gain, it's my favorites. Mm. You know, they're two of my favorites. He also made this uh, red velvet Supro, which was, which I use live forever. Usually my live rig is either this amp and one of these with a 412, or this rig and my Lanham uh, head. My friend Jim, he has a place called Amp Head in Portland, Oregon. He made this. This is his company, Lanham. And this is one of the best sounding apps I own. I've well. never seen a small miniature custom highway like this. No. 20. They, 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 this is one of the new ones, and they were kind enough to let me uh, have this one. It's a 20 watt. It, sa it sounds like a great old high watt as well. Damn. Uh, this is an H&H &H head. I bought this because I, someone had posted a photo that said, what do Mark Bullen and the Buzzcocks have in common? H&H. Mm -hmm. &H. So I found this for 50 bucks on, uh, I don't know if it's plugged in. It looks like a stereo when it's turned on. It's blue you know lights. I'll tell you, H&H &H power amps are what Eddie Van Halen used on to power all his rigs. He had H&H &H power amps. Really? I don't know if it's the same company, H&H, &H, but people Could don't be. know it. But they were H&H &H and they had big meters on them. And they're definitely Eddie Van Halen. That is insane. So looking. it looks like you're like your Marantz stereo yeah. or something. And it's 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 uh, solid state, obviously. You should have an eight track that comes out right here. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is one of my favorite amps. I bought this in the '80s from. Supposedly, it, it belonged to the guitar player from Quicksilver Messenger Service. Mm -hmm. His mom traded it in because she wanted him to have a new amp. So I got this thing for a hundred bucks back then. This is another really cool he, uh, amp I got off of eBay. Uh, I was looking for a Super Reverb, and this is my favorite amp I own, the Super Reverb. Okay. They're all mismatched. The, mm -hmm. the, there's the nothing speakers, cool yeah. in it. They're just whatever. It sounds, it's, it's the best sounding amp I own. This head belonged to Dylan Carlson from Earth. He, I think he used it on the first couple of Earth albums. Mm -hmm. And he sold this to me for 200 bucks. And he said he didn't know if, he, if it worked. So when I was in Portland, I, instead of just turning it on and playing through it, I took it in to get it looked at. And that's how I met Jim oh, shit. And, and ended up getting that head. So it's a good thing I did. But as soon as I got over there, he, he turned it on and he, he was like, this thing's it's fine. <laughs> not, it's fine. But have you tried mine? And I had to get that. <laughs> I love it. I mean, you have probably the most wild collection of, of not boutique amps, but you have amps that are like, Still accessible. Still, you can go on eBay, find them, and, oh, yeah. and get great sounds out of them. Oh you know? yeah, this is a really cool amp. This is this is a guy from Chile. He has a company called MP Custom, mm -hmm. and this was made for our friend 
Bill, who has Dream Studio guitars, and mm -hmm. Alan Johannes bought that for him, and he's he's yet to come and grab it. But one side is a Vox AC30, and the other side is a Marshall. It's so, so this, dangerous. Is, this, this is what Alan's been using live. He has one exactly like it, and he liked it so much he bought one for Bill. Yeah. And um, but Bill has not come to get this, and he's letting me use it. He's been very kind That's about sweet. that. Supro, I've been collecting for a while. Uh, these really, really quick, so you so these Supros and then that Supro, can you really explain really quick oh, yeah. the company? So Bruce Zinke bought the original Supro name. Mm -hmm. I guess it, it, he, he was friends with the original family. Yeah. He bought the name and started resurrecting as his own version of Supros. Mm -hmm. And then he was friends with the people that bought Supro. And they he they wanted to buy they wanted to start making yeah. the, the the ones that looked original. So yeah. these are old. These are the, the you know from the '60s. But now they make the ones that look exactly like this, but are perfect. So yeah. if you want a Supro sound that does it, that's durable. And that would be like Jimmy Page. People always go back to the first records. Yeah. Or you know, I I learned about these from uh, Chris Goss, Masters of Reality, because he talk about a genius. He's a, he, uh, one of the one of the greatest songwriters and singers of all time. And uh, Rated R, right? He did the yeah, Rated R. Record. Yeah, he he did he did so many. He did Screaming Trees. He did Mark Lanigan stuff. He did you know all the Masters of Reality albums are the best. There's not you know they're all amazing. Yep. So he turned me on to Supro, so I started buying those. And then our friend Dave Raphael, who made the Autac microphone and and um, components, he also has an amp company called F Tone. <laughs> and uh, this is his take. He he makes uh, specific amps. This is Jimmy Page's high watt that he played at Royal Albert Hall. This is the Eric Clapton Marshall Blues Breaker. is 15 watts. He's also made a Sabbath Volume 4 and a ZZ Top DeGueo and a couple of others that they're very specific, you know. And I, I was telling him, like, the Laney Super Bass is what Sabbath would do. Yeah. So it's funny that he's gone through all the genres and styles and really created it. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, those Epiphone Valve Juniors are cool. This guy out here was selling both of those for 100 bucks. I couldn't say no. They're kind of cool. It's just one knob turned up. Earthquaker had a head that was like that too. I was trying to buy one. Oh, and they, yeah. stopped, they stopped. I, I couldn't find one. I was so excited. That to thing get was that. cool. The white one. Yep. Yeah. You know why? Because I had a, a 1960s orange slave head. It had one knob on it, but it didn't have really tone unless you ran it with a preamp. Yeah. But all the doom bands of the world want it because it's a mad amp. So, like a, like a dummy, when I moved to Honolulu, Hawaii, yeah. I had sold it because it was just too heavy. <laughs> and to this day, I regret. Selling my my Mad Amp one knob slave head. Well, who knew that you were going to be coming back? I know the customs. Uh, Hutch gave me one that he found at the swap meet, mm -hmm. and my friend um, Rachel has a great place out here called Black Luck Vintage. If you guys, if it's open on your way out, you should okay. check it out. It's at the bottom of the Is hill. It a music store. It's she has everything. It's close. It's a it's just a vintage place. But yeah. she gave me she gave me the black one. It wasn't working, but I had a friend work on it. The Marshall, there was a guy named, I forgot his name now, but he had an amp shop in L.A. Not Am Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, Am Crazy. I, Jim, I, I, no, what he passed it? away, I think. Uh, but I Braha. Brought, Jerry, yeah. Jerry Braha. Jerry, Jerry, yeah, yeah. I, that was How did you know? Because it's a 78 head. I mean, when you told me an amp guy in L.A., he was the only guy that you could go into. I bought a 1967 or 68 Plexi head from him, Blown. <laughs> But it was for five hundred bucks. I once again. Uh, but anyway, so Am Crazy was a guy. That's that crazy that always, you knew that. Yeah, I'd always walk by a shop. That's who I'll always fixed yeah. my amps at the yeah. time. And he, yeah. he, but he had literally fifty Marshall heads in his shop. And I went through every single one, and I bought that JMP because it was the best. That guy had great taste in amps. I mean, oh, he was he's great. So good. Well, that's so funny that you would yeah, know totally that. Yeah, totally Am Crazy. It was Waldo's guitars or us. And then what was the guy that had the Dodge Viper? And he, yeah. And, uh, and he had that always those little skinny dogs that look like yeah. greyhounds. What's it? What was? What was the one that always had the Gibson amp sitting outside on the corner? Freedom. Freedom. Oh, that was place. That was like they had one in San Diego as I could, well. I couldn't afford that place, but yeah, that they place had that. So crazy. cool. That was amazing. It was like black market as well. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever go to black market music in San Francisco? Yeah. 
If you don't know it, there was a shop in Frisco you'd go to, and you would walk in, and they had like purple, red, every color you want, Marshall hedge, Marshall cabinets, and there were three deep. They had guitar pedals that were just stacked up, and like you couldn't even like, what's that bottom pedal? Yeah. Like, sorry, we can't get it it's jammed back here. Yeah. And it was amazing. I would always envision like some kind of container coming in from England. Yeah. <laughs> and that guy would just unload like, uh, it was like insane that place. It was one of the greatest music stores in the world. Yeah, that place was amazing. I bought this amp from my friend Gene Troutman, who I played with in Queens of the Stone Age. And this is a Gemini? Gemini. I happen to be a Gemini, so All that right. comes in handy. Uh, my friend Rachel from Black Luck came over the day after I bought this head. I love the, the graphics on this century. Yeah. The day after I bought this, she came by and she's like, do you want a cabinet? Someone just gave me this and I have no use for it. So she gave me this. Now I have these through that. And this I got at the swap meet for five bucks. Dude, I'm going to have to just come and just go shopping with oh, you. Oh, man. Unfortunately, not so much Not anymore. so much anymore. But, you know, hey. I quit going to the swap meet because I realized I had everything that I needed and kids deserve to try to find some. Check one, two. Yeah. So it's, it is battery powered, but the it's it's one of those like square ones, big ones. Well, it's it was like a bunch of uh, D batteries soldered together. Ooh. So I got my friend Jamie to put a little power supply, uh -huh. but you have to pull it out there. Check one two, and you can go out. I love the way it sounds. It's a voice projector from Electrosonics. All right, incorporated out of Albuquerque. It's local. Voice projector 17. But I also got another one that matches this, but it's out in storage because it's a lectern. They'd put them up in churches and it would be, oh. you know, like you would have the... Yeah, it's a large... Yeah, but, okay. but it has the built-in everything. Everything. But I think the only thing I didn't talk about was Brian's bass that went with oh, yeah. Loretta Lynn. And you have, you have to hold this thing because it's... This one. So when his dad gave him that to go on tour with... Eagles of Death Metal, uh -huh. it was in perfect shape. He did all that in about six years. Wow. That is just kind of beastly, just wore off completely everything. It's worn off. He, he had a belt buckle he made from a uh, Mack truck dog that was big, and it just ate. And his hands are giant and saw, sweaty. Yeah. And he would just, he just, that thing is the most crazy dub bass. It has no mid-range at all it's just all dub you know what it reminds me of like when you see those the earliest bass uh, the headstock looks like a telecaster oh yeah 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 it almost reminds you of that era if it almost had a telecaster yeah head. that was just beautiful so i guess it kind of wraps it up for stuff here other than you know thank you for your patience today dave and dave's been really wonderful to like you know to share his love of his life and, and and we were we were speaking about this off camera but it's really insane that where we are in our lives now we still come in and we get excited to talk about a guitar and amp and the spirit of these things so oh, yeah I, one dude hats off you're like a stand-up cat and i just love that you welcomed us in your house and oh man it's Producer been a pleasure Pro loves the fact that you shared all this information hopefully you can find some things to search for i'm gonna have to go back and yeah, take look some around. pictures here and you know find some stuff on ebay now you can still find stuff even if it, it crept up a little bit you can get it while it's hot and uh we have a our buddy here that's just a uh, chunk uh, he's just been chilling the whole time he's the best he's the boss here all right well we're out of here uh this is the tour of rancho de luna with mr dave catching thank you very much for coming in